Okay, so uh, today's video is going to be uh, just explaining how I actually process um, my astrophotography images. Um, so I'm going to be doing this in uh, Photoshop, so we'll just uh, open that to begin with. Um, also just uh, worth looking at is um, sort of where I store my images and how I store them and uh, therefore how I'm organising them. So uh, I'm on a, on a Mac using uh, I, iCloud to sort of keep my uh, images and be able to share them across different devices and things. So I've got a Deep Sky folder um, and I have a number of different folders here from the point of view of um, my BIOS library and dark library for when I'm stacking images. Um, I've got some data capture folder and uh, data acquisition. So it's the data capture folder that I'll be taking the data from and opening up that in Photoshop. Uh, it seems like my Photoshop is taking an age to load. Uh, never mind. Um, so these are the three images that I'm going to be using today. So I've got um, H Alpha, uh, O3, and um, Sulfur 2. Okay, Photoshop's now opened. Um, what I'll do is right click on these, open with, and open with Photoshop. Um, and that will open these three different TIFF files uh, ready for editing. Uh, let's just take a while for it to do that. And here are the three, um, the three images. So these are the images that have come um, out of the camera. They haven't been processed at all yet. Um, certainly from a Photoshop perspective. They have been stacked, so um, I will have taken um, a number of frames um, using the camera and then stack those together and I'll kind of show a video of that as well. But basically stacking those images together, um, which will increase the signal to noise ratio. So you, you'll hear this an awful lot and it's fundamentally around um, at, at the level of um, gain that the cameras are, are used at so traditional cameras it would be iso um, and on astro cameras uh, you talk about sort of the gain value um, this basically amplifies the the signal and it also amplifies the noise the base level of um, lack of information effectively so you'll get the sort of noise that you'll be familiar with um, in in images already um, but if you take multiple um, exposures you can basically sort of um, bring those into a stacking tool where it basically sort of puts them on top of each other um, and then the tool can then begin to understand okay what is what is a bit of signal i.e. Um, a star or some nebulosity um, and also what what isn't and therefore that's all of the background noise and it can begin to sort of um, remove that through just sort of the fuzziness of um, some pixels being sort of having some noise at some point and some not at other points. The fact that you're tracking this object through the sky basically shows that um, the areas where there is signal you can guarantee that that's actually something of interest um, and then the areas that don't have any signal you, you want to cancel that out effectively. Um, so we've got uh, the H-alpha um, channel, uh, oxygen 3 and sulfur 2. Um, and what we're going to be doing is basically stretching these images before we then combine them um, to create a colour image. So you'll notice at the moment that this is effectively um, a, a black and white mono image, um, which in, in themselves can be really quite interesting. Um, I have taken some, some mono images, uh, partly by mistake, but, um, but also, uh, yeah, they, they sort of show up a lot of detail that can be quite interesting to look at as well. So what we're going to do now is um, start that sort of stretching process um, and this is th there's many different ways of doing um, what I'm going to show you today um, but this is just one of them and it, it, it works for me um, but it's definitely worth um, searching for other videos on YouTube around sort of stretching of images as well to get that uh, data out of the image um, because yeah one way might not necessarily suit another way. Um, so, so one thing um, or one typical way that I tend to work is, is using adjustment layers for everything because it gives you that flexibility of being able to um, turn on and off that change and see if you're you're happy with the change that you've made is it is it something that's worth keeping or actually do you need to start again um, so each time you go into the um, adjustments layer um, I click on sort of levels to make an adjustment um, it will create a new layer 
down here on the right hand side um, and that's making changes on the image so if I just quickly um, move move this over to the left um, to stretch some of the information and pull out some of that detail of the, the nebula um, if you wanted to see what the impact of, of that without it you can just unclick it and then you can see the change um, the other thing that you also see in, in sort of doing this particular operation is actually I'm, I'm removing some, some data that's in that image. So I need to be kind of careful about, about doing that as well. Um, one thing or one mechanism that I've used to kind of avoid this, um, and this is already um, slightly blown out anyway, you can see um, the centre of the, um, or the core of the nebula where the, where the stars are and when they're actually sort of shining and illuminating that nebula area. Um, you can see that that's already blown out and that's partly down to the uh, the way that I've taken this image and the um, the exposure time of that image. Um, so really what you would really need to do in this situation is um, take some images of a, a shorter um, shorter exposure time uh, to be able to get that detail and then you could blend the two in together um, in order to get a bit more of a high dynamic range type image. But we're, we've got this data, we'll see, see what, how we can get the most out of it. So in this situation I've, um, I've stretched the, this image, sort of the, the very first stretch, um, but also what I can do is, is play with the layering mask here to be able to pull back some of that data and basically say stretch everything else but not that particular region. Um, so the way that I do that is just using the brush tool, simply make sure that you've got um, black selected there. If you haven't already, click on that and it'll give you a black and white. Uh, click that button and then it will switch that round so you've got a black um, black paintbrush. You can use the, um, the square bracket keys to increase the size of the brush and decrease the size of the brush. And then also don't forget the opacity here as well. I tend to use around about 30% but you can play about with it and see which works for you as well. Um, and effectively just sort of clicking on that, that region um, until it, it kind of looks like, yep, you've got the level of detail that you're after in that particular area, um, but you're retaining as much, of that, as much of that data as possible. So that's um, effectively that stretch done and then what I do is um, then potentially sort of perform another, another stretch here to see see if I can get as much detail out of this as possible. Um, I'm going to be quite aggressive here just just to sort of effectively prove the, prove what's what's capable. If you've got a, a stacked image with lots of um, minutes or even hours of, um, of data captured within that stacked image um, you can you can pull more data out of it and pull more of the detail of the image out of it um, without sort of increasing the noise significantly. Um, you'll also see in this video as well, you've got some really bizarre artifacts that seems to be some odd feature of um, Photoshop, um, whereby if you are using these layers, you do notice that um, it, it becomes a bit sort of, you haven't got the, the graduation of, um, of greys here, and I'll show a quick way of um, rectifying that. So what I'll do quickly is just um, bring back some of the, the detail in this area of the nebula, again just by using the paintbrush on the layer um, to, to pull that, that data back. Um, so the next step is to effectively um, collapse all of the layers down so that you can then um, see the final thing. So you would typically be saving this um, and you might want to actually sort of save, save this TIFF with all of these layers in, um, which will give you that opportunity of being able to come back to it at a later point. Um, or you can always just remove all the layers and then start again. Um, the interesting other thing with this is every time you, you process an image you'll find that you process it subtly differently um, each time and actually in doing that um, you get a completely different outcome. So you can process the same data, um, have the same person process that same data and you, you get different images out of it. Um, so I'm kind of happy with that. Um, what I do now is um, a, a keyboard shortcut which kind of then creates a layer of all of these layers and on the Mac it is Shift, Alt, Command and E um, and I think on PC that is Shift, Alt and Control, E um, and that basically creates a layer for all of those changes. Um, so if you, if you were to then sort of change any of these layers before 
that won't actually impact this anymore so it's kind of making a stamp and saying this is this is what I want to keep actually I've just noticed this area here um, really I could do with um, getting some of that detail back so actually what I'm going to do is just quickly well, I'll just prove, prove to you that if you um, use that brush and you're, you're painting into that layer of um, the in the layer mask you can see there's a little dot there you're not actually making any changes here um, whereas if I turn that layer off you can then see the layer details below um, so I think I'm kind of happy with with the way that's looking um, I'm just going to delete this layer um, and then press again shift alt command and E or shift alt control E if you're on PC um, and that's a bit better now there's there's that detail in uh, what's it the running man um, and then we'll just go along and do the same uh, with the O3 data uh, so come up into adjustments into levels drag that slider across um, to get as much of that detail as possible and you'll see here again that uh, we've got that sort of central um, part of the nebula is, is blown out again so selecting the levels layer mask, got the paintbrush selected again on black um, and then we can just click into that area uh, to recover some of that detail. Uh, I think this is another one of those areas where um, yeah, the, the exposure was, was already um, blown out so we're not going to be able to recover um, much more than we've already got there. Uh, so that's that done and then I think we could probably again get away with another stretch on this so we go back to the adjustments um, click on new layer adjustments um, and again pull this over to the left each time I'm kind of pulling it over I'm, I'm sort of looking at where the histogram feels like it's tailing off a bit I think you're always going to get um, a base level of pixels um, of, or of data in that histogram which will be from things like the um, the stars in the image as well so I'm kind of less worried about that at the moment um, but yeah it depends on your image in terms of whether that's a particular issue or not. So I think I'll do it roughly around that area um, and then let's recover that uh, nebula region again. And if you sort of see, yeah, using the sort of 30% opacity on that brush, um, it, it still looks fairly natural in terms of that area. Obviously that will be the brightest part of the region of the nebula, so you don't want to, um, you don't want to tone it down too much, otherwise it will just look really odd. So we've got that, I think I'm fairly happy with that, um, and then can Command, Alt and E again um, to, to bring that down. I think um, what I might also do actually as a final adjustment, and I'll do this to the other one as well, when you look at the histogram here, um, just kind of pulling pulling the, the dark level back a little bit, not too much because you can still there's still some detail in, in the dark area of the, the histogram. So I don't want to remove that too much because actually you might find that it could be some of these um, areas of, of outer nebulosity that, that I want to retain basically. You want to retain as much of it as possible. I'll just quickly do that with the, um, the H alpha channel as well. Let's just create another adjustments layer. Um, look at that and you can see that there's still some more detail. So actually I'm going to, I'm going to keep that as is. Let's delete that layer. Um, and then we'll move to the um, the sulfur image as well. And I think with this one, I think there's not really that much um, information in there at all from a, a nebulosity perspective. And there's a little bit. Um, I think each of the each of the different nebula in the night sky, um, obviously hydrogen is the by far the most abundant element, um, and so therefore, yeah, whenever you've got nebula. Um, there's going to be quite a lot of hydrogen alpha data in those images um, but actually yeah there is still a bit of uh, sulfur in in these images as well uh, so that kind of looks looks okay um, I'll again layer mask um, just to bring back some of that detail that you can see in the, in the core of the nebula there we go let me try another other adjustments, an image stretch, um, and then you can see yeah, that weird sort of artifact 
um, going on in, in Photoshop here, but as soon as as soon as you do um, Command Alt and E or Control Alt and E on PC, you'll see that that comes back and actually there's some some information it wasn't even rendering on the screen. Um, you can now see this this wispy area here, which looks really good. Um, so that's effectively the the stretching side of things. What what I do now, um, I would effectively normally save these images um, and keep keep them as is um, and you can do that but I won't won't do for this particular activity um, because these are the originals but um, what we now want to do is actually collapse all of these changes down um, to the base level so I go to layer and flatten image um, that gives us one image there and then I'll do the same with the oxygen layer over to layer flatten image and then again with the H alpha data layer and flatten image. So that's our three three base images and th what we want to do now is we've got this um, three different images as um, as our, our sort of individual channels and um, so what we need to do now is effectively map these to the red green and, and blue channels to create a color image. Um, so if you go over to the channels tab it doesn't matter which which image you pick as a start I just happen to pick the H alpha click on channels and then there's a uh, burger menu on the right hand side next to the channels tab click on that and then we want to go to merge channels um, in here um, you've got different modes we want to go for um, RGB color uh, three channels click OK um, and then that's where we get to select um, out of the images that we've got open where do we want to place them um, so in the Hubble palette um, approach to image processing of narrowband images um, the H alpha data tends to go in the or goes into the green channel. Um, the oxygen data goes into the blue channel, um, and the sulfur data goes into the red channel. You can play about with these as much as you want because fundamentally we're not creating a um, what would be called a natural view of this sort of deep sky object um, because we're we're capturing these very specific wavelengths that aren't they they sort of partly do line up with red, green and blue but actually the sulfur and the hydrogen data I think are on the sort of red end of the spectrum um, and the oxygen data is at the blue and there's not really anything that's really covering that green channel um, but yeah I, I believe it it is that um, the, the Hubble palette is, is chosen in this particular way because it allows um, astrophysicists and, and um, scientists to be able to sort of look at things in more detail of what's going on in the images in this in this particular way. So we click on OK, um, and that will bring together a, a, a color image. And you're probably looking at it going, "Well, that looks horrendous. That's not what we want." Um, and what we've got here is fundamentally the the three images that have been captured. They're not all um, completely in line with each other, um, and that's not the end of the world. We can we can fix that fairly easily. Um, what we need to do is go on to the um, move tool, click on that. Um, we've zoomed in a bit here as well so we can sort of pick um, a star that looks like it's quite a good star to line these images up with um, and almost sort of picking okay which is the best one to, to move to where and I'll probably go, I'll probably keep the blue where it is um, and then click on the green channel um, which then <laughs> selects all of the others as well. But um, re-enable those, click on the green channel still and then you can use the arrow keys um, to just nudge the image um, to where we want it to be and you're kind of effectively trying to get it to as, as middle as possible um, that's not always going to be possible because they, they don't always line up and I think it's probably down to the um, the, the lenses in the telescope or um, maybe in some cases if you're using a Newtonian um, reflecting telescope it might be that the stars are, are sort of misshapen because of collimation issues as well. Um, but yeah, so we then go to the, the red channel um, to, to bring this one up to where this needs to go as well. Um, it takes quite a while to kind of just nudge this into the right place. Um, but as you can see, eventually you get them lined up and you you get a, a fairly good looking star. And I think that's that's as good a place as any for this particular image. Um, and then you kind of bring this back and you can see that there's um, you've now got a colour image that's formed and it, it looks like a colour image. Um, on this particular image, um, so this is the, 
the images that we've all stretched um, and then placed into a single RGB image. But you can see it's got this very blue purplish um, hue to it and it's fundamentally around the, the, the colour temperatures just isn't really what it's it should be really. Um, so there's a number of things that you can do with this to, to bring it all into line but what I'll do um, here is um, pick the colour sample at all if it's not picked by default um, left click and hold it down and then you'll see the colour sample at all there um, and then the trick is to kind of know, know the night sky which I'm still not that familiar with but kind of finding an area of the sky that looks like there's not really much um, nebulosity there and, and you, you could get a, a suitable black point from um, I'm thinking I'm going to pick down here in the bottom corner I think that looks fairly good um, and you can then see the RGB values and this is another sort of weird weird bug that I've seen with this um, whereby that clearly isn't a, a neutral colour it doesn't make sense that that's 30, all 38 and the way that I've seen to sort of fix this particular problem is actually saving the image and then when you save the image um, it, it sorts itself out um, so I'll save this into uh, let's just leave it in in this, this folder for now um, when you save a TIFF you get the options of um, what to do with uh, the, the actual image compression itself um, and also the, the layer detail as well. There's only one layer at the moment so you don't have layer compression um, but these images can get very big very quickly uh, so the, the important thing here is to and you, you use a compression algorithm that doesn't remove um, any image data so anybody that's familiar with JPEGs you can you can have a high quality JPEG or you can reduce the quality which reduces the size but actually yes it removes and starts to create artifacts in that image. You definitely don't want that at this stage so um, yeah using either sort of zip compression or um, LZW um, and I'd choose sort of a zip compression for the layer information as well if, if we had them. So click OK there, uh, let that save Um, and it, yeah, it seems like that's not quite fixed this yet. Although to be fair, that that says untitled, which is a bit weird. Just leave that point. Pick another point. It's still not right. So let's close this image. Feel like it's actually saved it properly yet. Uh, let's reopen this image and finally, so saving it, closing it, reopening it, um, you can now see that it's um, it's got that RGB value that looks definitely a lot lot better than it was before. Um, I might pull this down a bit further down to this corner here. Um, so yeah, you've got reds are quite high and the blues are quite high and the green greens are quite low effectively so zero is black and um, the higher number is, is pushing to the to the to the whites effectively so what I do to balance this you can use curves you can use levels you can probably even use the um, hue saturation sliders as well but I, I like the levels approach so create a new adjustment layer in levels um, and then using this drop down here you can then select which which channel or which color channel you want to change um, the black point on. Um, so what I'll do here is kind of pull this to the right and I want to basically get the red, green and blue to the same number. Um, the actual numbers here aren't, aren't too important um, certainly for this image I'll just change the blues and then explain, explain why. So there's a, a danger, and I got this um, this point from uh, one of Astro Stasis videos, um, and I might have actually <laughs> might have actually made this a bit darker than it really should be. Um, but she sort of highlighted the point that lots of people will try and make their uh, background as black as possible, 
but actually in certain areas of the sky it's not really that black at all and certainly this area of um, the night sky um, the Orion Nebula there's there's so much sort of nebulosity around um, that region of the sky but even the dark areas actually shouldn't really be that dark um, so don't get caught up on this RGB being too low um, but yeah, it all kind of depends on which, which part of the sky that you've chosen and also whether actually there is any um, nebula in that, in that particular region. But the colour balance of this looks, um, looks a lot better now. The, the, the dark area of the sky doesn't look like it's got a, um, a particular colour cast to it. Um, you've also noticed that the stars are very purple as well and that's, that's a bit indicative of the fact that um, the narrow bands um, Filters that I'm using is quite a typical um, problem that comes out of that, and there is a way of sort of removing that that I can show later on. So that is the, um, I guess the the base level of bringing together a mono images into a colour image, lining everything up, um, and then sort of colour correcting that that base layer of correction. And you can at this stage then uh, begin to do sort of more stretching, introducing more contrast to the the image. Um, and just getting it how you want it to look. So what I might just do here is, is just um, stretch the image further and just see, effectively see what, what I can kind of get away with really. Um, if I kind of go a bit extreme you can see that there's, there is still a lot of detail in this image. Um, if I zoom in a bit more you can see. Um, so the outer edges of, of the Orion Nebula, there's, there's even more sort of faint detail here that if you turn that off you can see that you can barely see it without that stretch um, so you can potentially sort of stretch this um, even further um, but obviously you've got to be really careful about this this area being blown out here um, what I might do is just um, do the same trick as before um, to, to bring back a level of that detail um, and, and see what that looks like might have been a bit too aggressive with with the usage of that, um, but at least yeah, it shows you the the principles behind um, behind this and how you can get that detail out. Um, and then because of that stretch, you'll also see that the um, the the black point has kind of increased again um, as a result of that stretch. So you might then need a further um, stretch to sort of bring those that dark area down a bit more so at least um, you can see with with these two stretches um, the starting point you can see this um, this part of the nebula too clearly um, the first stretch pulled that data out um, and pulled that out of the image and then the second stretch to bring back the black point you can see that we've managed to um, bring back the contrast of the image um, and you've still got that that level of nebula region that's coming through there. Um, I think I'll probably leave it there. There's many other things that you can begin to sort of um, do with this image. You will need to uh, crop it for example because you've got the, the border where we needed to move the image around um, to line all of the stars up. Um, so you need to crop that, that bit out. Um, there's another aspect to this that um, quite a lot of people do so if we create that um, sort of combined layer of all of those changes and then you go into um, filter and camera raw filter um, you can bring out the the raw editing um, tool and in this tool as well you've got, then got all of the the power and capability that you have with normal raw editing of images um, that you can begin to sort of push these things even further in certain ways as well so they an example is yeah you can bring out the exposure even more and then you can use the highlights slider to um, pull that, that highlights, the, the highlight details kind of back um, maybe play around with the, the shadows as well to bring that sort of con contrast level back play around with the, the texture sliders and the clarity to sort of pull out a bit more um, <laughs> texture of, of the nebula um, and maybe even sort of playing around with the, the dehaze um, capability in the raw editor as well to, to boost some of the contrast as well which um, I think works quite well um, and then uh, quite a lot of people tend to use the um, the, the noise 
um, reduction within this tool as well um, to, to be able to sort of control some of the noise in, in the image. So you'll see here that it's, um, you can see all of that colour noise and, and background noise. Um, again, sort of, you can just bring, bring those things up. Um, let it process it and, and reduce that noise. Obviously whenever you're doing any noise reduction you've got that risk of um, losing some of the detail of, of the rest of the image so um, it, it kind of fixes one problem and introduces another one. Um, but it's kind of looking uh, looking acceptable. I think um, the, the, there's some issues with, with I think the, the the focus and the detail of some of this ish, this this image, but um, it, it shows you the the fundamental sort of editing principles really. Uh, so we click OK to accept that, um, and wait for that to go back into uh, into Photoshop. Um, so yeah, that's that's made those um, camera raw changes to that particular layer, um, and be a, a sensible thing to um, just label um, your layers with, with what you've changed as well. So just double clicking on that layer, editing the text and saying that's what it is. Um, so I hope you've enjoyed this, um, you, this tutorial. Hopefully it's explained some of the things around um, how I get sort of the images from my camera, how I combine and create a, um, an image that is then shared on um, Instagram. So if you like the video, um, please uh, subscribe to the channel, uh, like the video, and uh, I should be doing a few more um, videos in the, in the coming weeks and months. Thank you very much.